Hello, and thank you for joining me for this introduction to the Art Deco Delights of Bournemouth. My name is Catherine Ferry, and I'm a founder member of the Seaside Heritage Network, a not-for-profit organisation that aims to celebrate the best of the British seaside. This talk focuses on a single street just above Bournemouth seafront, the interwar transformation of which can tell us a lot about the changes happening in leisure and holiday practices in the 1920s and 30s. Westover Road was pretty much Bournemouth's first street. In the 1830s, the town barely existed. Landowner Sir George Taps Jervis employed the Christchurch-born architect Benjamin Ferry to prepare designs for an exclusive marine village at the mouth of the Bourne Stream on what was then the Hampshire coast. It's now in Dorset, but it's the south coast of England. This watercolour shows you what Ferry came up with. And you can see the smart villas of Westover Road highlighted here under the orange line. Eight of these grand Italian villas with large gardens were built in 1837. The wider scheme didn't come to fruition, but Westover Road became the heart of the early resort and it set the social tone going forward. Now, a hundred years later, these buildings were really out of date and burgeoning Bournemouth wanted to appeal to a wider audience. Bournemouth's growth was really impressive. You just have to look at the census figures. In 1841, it had just 165 residents. In 1871, that was nearly 6,000. And in 1891, the number of residents was approaching 60,000. In 1936, a national survey pronounced Bournemouth as Britain's richest town, something that the mayor put down to its healthy climate, which attracted attracted wealthy people, especially the retired. Now, the press cutting here on the left shows you the style of the Victorian villas, which began to be pulled down in the 1920s to turn Westover Road into a modern amusement centre. It was to offer varied forms of entertainment, up-to-date accommodation, and just as importantly, the new facility of parking for the growing number of visitors coming by car. The map on the right shows you Westover Road in relation to the beach down here at the bottom. And this is Westover Road marked on the lower orange line. Hinton Road is here behind it and it's the block in between that retains most of the buildings put up in a mixture of Art Deco and what we'd call seaside modern style between the wars. The great pride in this redevelopment can be seen embodied in these two 1930s railway posters that promoted Bournemouth as a stylish modern resort. So the red building just here is the pavilion which fronts onto both the seafront here and Westover Road behind, its west side facing the lower gardens. The stylized depiction of the buildings opposite here on Westover Road show more densely packed urban landscape with much taller buildings than had been there in the past. The poster on the right conflates the distance between the two sides of Westover Road to create a sense of activity and urbanity. Just look at how the people are dressed up to go to the pavilion, to the cinema here, to the ice rink to see a performance. The first element in the transformation was the pavilion, shown here. This was intended to be the largest entertainment venue of its kind in the country, so it's really staking Bournemouth's claim to be one of the nation's leading seaside resorts. It cost the huge sum of £250,000, that's approximately £19 million today, but it was an eye-watering sum at the time. And it was designed by the London architects G. Wyville Home and Shirley Knight, who'd won a national design competition. The pavilion has two main parts. Next to the beach was a ground floor dining room with double height windows and a tea lounge with dance hall on the floor above. And this was the era where a dance hall was an absolute must for any seaside resort because it was just a complete craze. The upper hall had the concert hall, which you can see here in uh, an early design from the opening brochure. And this was designed for use by the municipal orchestra, but it was quickly upgraded for theatre use with a fly tower added in 1934. It all speaks of a very glamorous location. 
This 1930s aerial view details the attractions opposite the pavilion, which you can see here. So we've got the Westover ice rink with its wonderful stepped art deco windows. The Regent Cinema, which was later joined by a second cinema on the other side of the ice rink. Then we've got the majestic garage next door and the Palace Court Hotel, which uh, is at the end there. All of these buildings actually survive, though with mixed fortunes. And here I've included the dates that they were opened and the architects responsible for their design. After the pavilion, the rest of Westover Road was the vision of local architects. And that, I think, makes it something quite special. The Westover Road ice rink to start with cost £50,000. It offered 10,000 square feet of ice rink on the first floor because it was built over the showroom of Westover Motors. Its owner, Major Sharp, commissioned it so that his son and daughter could have a place to learn to skate. What lucky children! It was an exciting new attraction when it opened in December 1930 and the opening date reminds us of the importance of the winter season, that it was a crucial idea for resorts like this to keep people coming throughout the year. In the summer, they had an ice follies show for summer visitors. That is now in use as a gymnasium. Movies were the mass media of the 1920s and the 30s. And the Italian Renaissance style Regent Theatre, you can see in the middle of this image, was designed for Provincial Cinematograph Theatres Limited. It opened in the same year as the pavilion, and you can see the final design as a response to that building. Its facade is decorated with faience tiles, and it has this sort of open loggia here, a, a kind of covered outdoor gallery. It originally could seat 2,267 people, had an orchestra pit and a fantastic Wurlitzer organ. It was refurbished to make two screens in 1969 and then split into a six screen Odeon in 1986. It closed in 2017 and it's now disused uh, and, and really is looking for uh, a new future. The next building along is a reminder that Art Deco wasn't only about glamorous cinemas, houses and hotels. It also included more functional structures like car parks. The growing number of cars during the 1930s and the rise was exponential meant that parking facilities were needed at seaside resorts, particularly during the summer when they became very overcrowded. The former Motormax garage was a private initiative and one of the earliest in England. It was originally entered from both Hinton Road at the back and Westover Road at the front, but the Westover Road half you can see here was later converted into hotel accommodation. It was a steel frame building with six storeys designed for 900 cars on 13 staggered levels. The final building in the row is the Palace Court Hotel. And here's a very wonderful Art Deco image that came from a luggage label of the time. I'd love to have that on my suitcase. This building opened in 1935 and it provided the latest in luxury accommodation. Just imagine staying here and sitting out on one of those streamlined sun trap balconies that gave the building a fashionable ocean liner look. It was the, the most elite and desirable holiday cr craze of the period to be able to go on a, on a liner like the Queen Mary. If you couldn't afford it, you could perhaps stay in the Palace Court Hotel and pretend. The ground floor originally housed shops with a members club, bar and restaurant above with 70 rooms featuring the latest novelties of the time, bedside telephones and private bathrooms. You know, these were quite exclusive and expensive things for the period. The interiors, as you can see here, were very streamlined. The restaurant had gilt walls hung with curtains in brick red, black and gold, while the club recreation room boasted what was said in the press as a gay colour scheme of scarlet and fawn, gold columns, chromium tube radiator, radiator grills and serpentine bar. Above on the upper floors, there are actually flats which had kitchenettes, but the residents could also order meals from the hotel dining room. So it was a kind of mixed use for residents who wanted to stay longer term. And the scale of the building had quite an impact on the skyline of Bournemouth. If you're standing on the beach today, you know, it's still a really striking building. 
it, it's is still in hotel use as the premier inn so you can still go and stay there unfortunately the interiors no longer look like this to end then here is arthur john seal credited in the local press as the man who changed the face of bournemouth his name was on all of those buildings along westover road he was born in Derby in 1886 and he trained there as an architect before moving to Bournemouth in 1910. It was a place of huge opportunities at the time and Seal really took them in partnership with the architect Philip Hardy during the 1920s and then with his own firm at the AJ Seal and Partners from 1933. They were based in this office which he designed on Hinton Road. It's just behind the Palace Court Hotel. In 1932, the home he built for himself at Sandbanks, just along the coast, caused quite a stir for its ultra modern design. It was called Showboat and it was white cement rendered with a flat roof and balconies. It actually appeared on the cover of Ideal Home magazine and it was so exciting that coachloads of tourists were taken there to have their photos taken in front of this shockingly new building. So this is just a taster, really, of some of the stories revealed by looking at a single street in Bournemouth. But the Seaside Heritage Network has produced a trail around these and other interwar buildings, which will soon be available via our website, thanks to funding from the UK Research and Innovation Fund and Bournemouth University. The address is here, so do keep an eye out for it if you'd like to explore Art Deco Bournemouth further. It's always good to look up anywhere you go, look beyond the current use of these buildings or unfortunately disuse and reimagine them as part of a glorious episode in the town's past. Thanks very much for listening.